Yeah. Just wait a wee, wee minute till everybody's sitting down, sitting quite comfortably. There's a few seats left, so can can you can everybody hear me? Is that better? That's better. It's too far away from the mic. So uh, a very big welcome tonight to the reference library and uh, another Edinburgh Beats event. My name's Carol Ma, and I'm sort of standing over Annie Bell. We don't we just these events. But I sort of jumped at the chance when I when, I, when there was a list of authors coming, and I saw Pete Wilkins' name on the list, and I thought, oh God, that's that's taking back some, save the whale and all the rest of it. So well, not that old. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, David who also works in the library, has given us all kind of nostalgia badges. So that's going back if we have back from collecting over forty years of his badge collection. So well done to him. So uh, just a couple of housekeeping kind of issues. Um, obviously, we're not expecting a, any fire alarm or anything to go off. <laughs> the, the fire exit sits over on my left hand side here, and there's another one on my right hand side. Um, and then I just ask you to, if you've never switched your mobile phone off, can you do that now? That would be fabulous. And if you want to tweet anything, so all you've got to do is, what's it? Oh, it's hashtag Edinburgh Beats. So that would be fantastic if you can, you know, participate in that. And Graham from the Library Services sit at the back and do some tweets himself. So I'll just pass you over to Pete the now before this mic kind of sags totally. Um, so Pete will be sort of speaking for about, what, 35, 40 minutes, and there'll be time for some questions at the end. Uh, and that'd be fabulous. So, over to people. Thank you very much. We have a couple of trouble makers in here this evening, so if there is any trouble, I'd like you to support me getting rid of the ropes and they would sign the And I promise to help me. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, it's very well going to need to turn out tonight. Thank you very much for coming. I hope the next hour or so is going to be entertaining. Nothing else. Um, I'm here to talk about this book that I wrote over the last 10 years, I suppose, it took me to write it. Uh, it was launched last year at the Royal Geographic Society when I did the second David Bellamy uh, lecture at the Royal Geographic Society. Um, I'm not going to say much about the book. It's at the back if you fancy buying it tonight. But the, what I'm going to talk to you about is essentially what's in the book and the sort of journey that I've had from my home beginnings in Deptford in South East London as a lorry driver to the height of uh, take a Greenpeace ship to the Antarctica on five separate occasions. I'd like to also talk about the Green Movement generally towards the end of this talk. I'm sure it's something that we can talk about uh, in, in Q&As later. Um, I wrote it largely because uh, my parents, uh, my father died when I was very young, my mother died uh, a few years ago, but she never left a ritual of her life. I didn't know really what she, she went through the war and all that sort of stuff. I never really got a handle on her life and her place in the, the firm of the Wilkinson family and indeed in society at large. So I wrote this for my kids. I had kids quite late in life. I've got two teenage daughters that are just off to university. I've got a wife that's much younger than me. So it felt the right time to actually write something down and give them some idea of what I'd been up to because hitherto, Despite the fact that I've got in this video and articles I've written in the newspapers and press clipping, God knows what they're saying, not one bit of interest in what I've been doing for the last you know, 35 years as kids like us do. Let's forget this with a Roman book. It's not an attempt to self aggrandizement I promise you. I think my achievements in the Green Room were pretty modest overall, and a lot of them were pyrrhic. It didn't last very long either, which is a bit of a shame. But nonetheless, I thought it was a, it was a journey worth recording, and um, so I did it. This was uh, the first place that I ever looked at. A friend of mine threw me a book one day um, across the room and the flat on the floor. I said, I want to read this. You're always going on about the environment. And it was the friend of the Earth and I went to hand it. I don't know if anyone remembers it. It's a collection of essays from people around the world talking about uh, the population, resources, uh, animal extinctions, loss of habitat, the whole thing. And I read it. I, I agree with every word of it. So the next day I went to the front of the area. Uh, and this was our reference. So first of all, it's a pub. And it is a pub. 
And that's when we did most of our work to make the this world. Now, what was with here? Uh, on the front right next door, the Essex Servant, uh, it came, um, place where we did a lot of our work and a lot of alcohol was drunk, I must admit. Alcohol was quite um, important to us in those days. We, we seemed to get a lot of ideas after a couple of times. <laughs> um, one particular night, Brian Sir, I don't even remember the name, but he started Friends of the Earth and he was my mentor for, for a long time. He was at the um, at King's College when someone from the Sierra Club in the States came over and spoke to a group of uh, people at uh, King's College and sowed the seeds for the idea about setting up an environmental group called Friends of the Earth. And they did, that. there was one going in the United States at the time, but they set up the, the English chapter and I was there within about three days of them setting up. And I moved into the office and um, there were piles and piles of empty Schweppes bottles Remember the Schweppes non-returnable drinks bottles, the, uh, the soft drink people, Schweppes, a long time ago. Um, they were called the soft drink people. But we did a series of posts which showed that they weren't really the soft drink people at all because the program glass can be very dangerous. And the idea was to collect 2,000 of these bottles and take them back to Schweppes to protest about one trip packaging. And of course, it was the supermarkets that were coming into, into play at the time. They weren't equipped and weren't prepared to take back the empty bottles. And so we moved into an era, which we had today, where perfectly serviceable bottles are not really used, but we smash them up and decal it and make these bottles from them, which is a ridiculous thing to do. And we these are the office, and that's where I my first sort of blooding, if you like, about the environment generally, and in particular resource use. And I ran into a lot of extraordinary people. I'll show you a picture of someone in the minute. Um, who is now um, with the think tank at Chatham House, who is a physicist, uh, and if you mention Amy Lovins' name in the States, they're almost sort of uh, recognised that he's deified. He runs um, the Rocky Mountains Institute, um, a brand new size of a, you know, of a planet, I understand. Richard Sandra, died from his retirement, who is the environmental plutocrats, as they call him, and now runs a thing called 3 eg has been an advisor to Rio Tinder Zinc for 20, 30 years now. So this is the bunch of people that are starting the Friends of the Old Class. Uh, the only person missing is in New Zealand at the time that picture was taken. This, this was a article that was published in the Sunday Times. And it would have Friends of the Earth had lived. I never felt comfortable with Friends of the Earth, to be quite honest with you. Being from Oxford Science, and I was from Bedford, I was a lorry driver. And I never felt that I was going to get the sort of responsibility that I felt I needed and deserved. And in fact, it's only told me years later after I'd left that um, you weren't in front of the you required, because the big one answer with Friends of the Earth is sort of a classist organisation. You have to be an Oxford type to get on. It's not like that now, but it was in the early days. This was a good old boys club, an old boys and old girls club, obviously. And I wasn't really going to get anywhere being friends of the earth. I think that was my go-to. This is something to do with the friends of the earth. I think look a bit like this now. This was breaking new ground. This is 2,000 miles of a in and around a common garden where our offices were. Going back to the hills of Schweppes in the Barnes West End. We protested because of the uh, resource implications of one trip packaging. We protested because we were going with the way in which we were being cavalier with our environment. Um, we didn't get anywhere, unfortunately, as you can see from today. We made the point that we actually brought the environment to a lot of people. And the idea behind these protests, which was brought to a fine art with Greenpeace, was to use a protest like this in order to gain a platform from which to argue your case to a lot of people through the media. That's exactly what it was about. We moved on to the language as well. I've been a friend of the earth for some time, and I think it was there about seven years in total. Um, I I don't know if you remember the old Romeo machines. Anyone probably enough to remember Romeo machines where you had a skin on sort of an antiquated wheel 
the, the ad income increase, and you turned the wheel, and one suit came out that had three to it, and you had to do that for a week to be paid, obviously, of the, the document you were printing. The, uh, the whaling yeah. menu that we produced, which set out the case against continued commercial whaling, was 84 pages long, I remember it distinctly, and I had to print off 100 copies of this, of the whale menu. So you imagine what my arm looked like, so we produced the report, the case was set out, we took the report to the government, we took the report to the International Whaling Commission, the case was cut the bottom as far as we were concerned, commercial whaling should stop, and it went on, as usual. But we didn't take on a plastic model, it wasn't plastic, it was a blow-up plastic whale, but all the time, inside the International Whaling Commission one year, I uh, was protesting to bring the issue back to the commission region. And it's actually waiting for me soon. And uh, as luck would have it, the uh, Thames tide ripped the seam of the whale charge. It was about to be for longest thing, and it sank. And that was so sort of emblematic as far as the press were concerned. We got more coverage out of the whale sinking than we would have had if it was a big sailing We were pushing the barriers, we were pushing the boundaries of Capri. It was a very exciting time. But I knew that my time at Prince of the Earth was, was coming to an end. And now I'm in this one. Um, David Freeman died uh, in 2004, so I've been a car accident. But um, I'd been working at Prince of the Earth. I've left Prince of the Earth. I decided I was going to get rid of the job. I don't know why I thought that. I thought, well, I could have gone down and rigged the job. So I took a job in the post office and I was trained to be a counter clerk and selling stamps basically. And it was it was pressing more, it was like going back to the Keynesian times. And uh, the phone rang one day, I'd been there about six months, and the phone rang in the post office in Hampstead in Essex. The phone never rang anyway. The never certainly never rang for me. And uh, the overs in the post office came out sheepishly and said, There's a phone call for you. It's gone right home. So I picked the phone up and there was this, this guy in the other end of the phone. He said, uh, is that Peter Wilkinson? I said, yeah. He said, um, do you want to come and work for Greenpeace? Completely out of the blue. And I'd heard about Greenpeace and I'd seen their exploits in North America opposing the Russian whaling fleet. And I just jumped at the chance. And within three days, I was sitting across the table with this guy in a pub in Deptford talking about how we're going to pay him a £25 week to come and work for him. Well, seemed a good deal to me, so I took it. Um, this guy was very influential in my life, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, he didn't make friends very easily. Um, but I think I was the closest thing he had to a friend of me in Greenpeace. Um, he was ruthless, actually, absolutely ruthless. And he engineered my demise from Greenpeace 15 years later, which we'll get into in a minute. But um, quite, quite an incredible guy from really now. Things happen when you were around at Taggart. Even if it wasn't falling down on the and right in there. But it was quite amazing. He was well known for his opposition to uh, French nuclear testing in the Pacific. And I've got to look at my notes here because talk about some statistics. Um, he found his little boat called Vega through the time in the Uh He sailed it into the explosion zone. Around the world. The French said they were going to atmospherically test a series of nuclear weapons at Moro in the Pacific, as far away from Paris as they could get, and they were going to collect an exclusion zone around the island into which David would take a of his boat. And he played a game of cat and mouse with the French over a long, long period of time. And eventually they boarded his ship, they beat the hell out of him. I, uh, he lost sight in one eye. Um, there were three or four black and white pictures taken of the beating, and that was the evidence that he used in French courts in order to charge the French Navy with piracy. Um, and he didn't win that particular case of piracy, but he won the long term battle when the testing in the Pacific um, stopped. I'm going to concentrate on the French just a little bit. But in 1985, um, Greenpeace went to some of the islands in the Marshall Islands where these tests took place, and they evacuated 
uh, about 300 people from our own runway, where they, which had been dusted with teaming with radioactive uh, material. And they moved them to a safe one in Magetta. Um, so there was been routine contamination of the islands. The US carried out 67 tests around the Marshall Islands um, during that period of time. And uh, the Marshall Islands are now taking the US and the UK and other testing nations in the, in the Pacific to come. Uh, and that should come to the International Criminal Court, uh, or the International Court of Justice, I should say, excuse me, uh, at some point in the next two years. Um, there have been 2,000 tests of nuclear weapons since 1945. I just need a little aside. Uh, my, my, where I live in Suffolk uh, is so uh, well. Uh, we we'll get that water from the well. And the environment agency come and test the water uh, once every while. And they give me a printout of the contaminants that are in the, in the well. Most of it comes from the you know, good old farmers who uh, come and spray the fields every five minutes with pesticides, herbicides, and things that kill the bugs. And you know, making our, our soil just an infertile substrate. That's where most of the contaminants come from. But there's strontium in my room, sir, but within my house. Uh, there's uranium, and there's all sorts of uh, cesium-137, which comes from the local power station. A lot of this stuff is still going around in the atmosphere. It's from the 1945 tests and the subsequent tests that took place in, uh, in the Pacific and other places all around the world. And we don't know what the Russians have been doing, because we don't really know what they really. Um, testing Testing starts in 1996. Um, the French compensated 150,000 people for contamination um, as a result of the, uh, the test that they were carrying. In 2009, they paid up 50 million euros to. Uh, to those who have been contaminated over that same year period. So, you know, nuclear weapons testing is a big issue, and it's been it's been stopped. Largely the result of David Taggart's work in the Pacific and, of course, a lot of other people working internationally as well. So we've got a lot to, to, uh, to thank David Taggart, of course. We moved on to, uh, to sealing as well. Uh, the uh, North American movement has been involved in trying to stop 250,000 two seal pups being clubbed to death from the infinite ice for some time. Um, it was something that, to me, was an island rights issue rather than an environmental issue, but nonetheless, it was a big issue. And the group has made a lot of noise about it, and its reputation hung very much on its, uh, on its opposition to um, this, this angry slaughter that goes on, which is ritualised now. Um, you know, the boats that go off to the Newfoundland ice flows get blessed by you know, the local mayor and all that sort of stuff, and they go of these. Uh, Little seals to death before they're like to black tail and mothers, and they turn their pelts into trivia, drink some trivia throughout Europe. Well, we stopped that because we stopped the, uh, the European market for those shoes, the trivia. And then the, the, the um, 250,000 seals uh, were saved by collapsing the market. Sadly, it's up to its uh, previous level, they're, they're still carrying on. Uh, killing these seals. Um, none of this is something we did. Bring them marks on the back of the seal. Um, our Canadian friends and Greenpeace decided that what they would do is they would spoil the value of the pelt by spraying the, uh, the seals with this harmless green dye. You see, you've got a bit of a dye. Um, I got a, a little test saying that um, it's totally backfired that the green seal pelts now highly prized and that. Um, Sealed with our green dial with a one screen kill first. Fortunately, take the first one got that text, and it wasn't true. But uh, it was something that um, made us think seriously about you know, what we should be doing in terms of tactics to try to stop this stuff going on. We moved on to London. Um, in the 1930s, we had 50,000 whales a year uh, until we ran out of whales to kill. Um, Greenpeace got its first. Um, Grant from the Dutch branch of the World Wildlife Fund gave us £27,000 in which to buy a ship to go and oppose the uh, Icelandic whaling operation. Um, and we bought a ship called the Sir William Harding, uh, which was renamed 
the Rainbow Warrior. And I'm not going to get into where the name came from because there are so many different stories about who came up with the name first and what myth it's attached to. But it was loosely linked to the to the Red Indians in um, Native, so say Native Indians of Sweden in North America, who were known to have a myth about people coming together from all white walks of life, creeds and colours, forming a nation called Rainbow Warriors who would defend the earth. That's where it came from originally, who actually decided that we would call this the world as an element. We got into, um, into the whaling issue, and the reason we went to Iceland is because all the statistics that we could find points very clearly to the fact that the uh, Finn boats in particular, which were they've been killing, were reaching a point of uh, extinction. And the two, the two answers that we used were that the age of maturity of the whales was dropping like a stone, so they were maturing younger, so they could reproduce at a younger age. And the catch per unit effort, the amount of, you know, to put it crudely, the amount of fuel that you had to use to go and kill a whale was going up. So all the indications were, and they, these were indications that were accepted by the International Whaling Commission. We put it together, put it in a report, as we've done earlier with, with Friends of the Earth 10 years earlier, put it to the International Whaling Commission, and they hugged and hugged about it and said, mm, very interesting, but thank you very much, carry on killing whales, Iceland. So we went to the island, and uh, we came out of the we were arrested as usual, in jail as usual, boat was impounded as usual. We employed lawyers to try and get us out, and eventually we just took off. Because that's what we used to do. To be quite honest with you, they were pleased to see the back of us, and we were pleased to see the back of them. So it was a win win situation. We just used to leave. And we did that in Spain as well. We were the Spanish, believe it or not, in the 80s, we were still killing whales, and we carried out anti whaling activities off, off the uh, Portuguese coast. And we were arrested, taken to, to, to court and they took, they, they took us under arrest. And they even, to make sure that we didn't leave, they took a thing from the engine, thrust block, which was a huge piece of metal that sat in the propeller shine, kept it in line so that they, they could turn the propeller correctly. Without it, you couldn't start the engine. Well, we got hold of the blueprints for the ship um, and we made another thrust block and we put it in the back of a uh, a van, drew it through France and wherever else, got it into Spain, and uh, we caused diversion, we caused a fake fight, two of the guys went in the fight, and the, and the, the, the Spanish police came over with their submachine guns trying to break it up. Why are we doing that? We hunt the, uh, the um, replacement um, cross up onto the ship, put it in place, tied it down, started it, told the guys we were just you know, keeping the engine running for maintenance reasons. It worked, we were fine. And we survived. And it was in, it was in a place called, uh, for, uh, for, uh, Vigo. That's right, it was in Vigo. And Vigo is the Spanish government's, um, NATO base. So there was this ship, um, taking off after we were arrested, wheeling its way in uh, these battleships. And, uh, they sank the guy who was in charge of the NATO base because we got away with it. Um, so we used to do those sorts of things in those days, and it was it, not only was it great fun, but it was effective because the press were over like a rash. They just wanted to be on the green ship, but we could not do anything without them really wanting to be there. And it was because we were open, we were transparent, but everyone went on on the ship, it was open to uh, inspection by anybody that wanted to be there. And basically, uh, it's nothing uh, most of the world is our they still do it scientifically, but international commercial one is now. Oh, no, it's coming back on, on the agenda. Do you want to turn our attention to waste dumping? It's just the thing that I wasn't particularly interested in. Because as the ship was going from Iceland to Spain, I looked at me in the office looking at the course we were taking, and I saw a red square in the charts, and it said dumping ground on it. So I made it through the course. It was actually going to be right in the, in the, the path of the, the, the Rainbow Warrior, which going to Iceland to Spain. I'm over from the forest, and I found out that since the 1950s, uh, the UK, along with the uh, Netherlands, and Belgium, and a couple of other clubs, have been dumping radioactive waste daily in the winter. Um, and so we tried to justify doing this. And, um, 
there wasn't any real justification for it whatsoever. They were using the international commons of the oceans as a dumping ground for their own private waste, um, which we objected to. So we went to the Mother Dumping Convention, which is where you really have to go to, to make your political case. And we took to the London Dumping Convention, where they said it's fine. So we few countries that were doing it. The Americans stopped it, by the way, years earlier, because they were worried about the impact that it might have. They were dumping in the Marianas Trench. When we went into this a bit further, the UK had been dumping radioactive waste in a variety of places all over the European arena, some of which had gone into the Herd Deep, which is just north of the Channel Islands. Um, when we talked to people on the, on the dump ships themselves, they were telling us that in the 60s, they were just getting outside the 12 mile limit and dumping it anywhere. And it, it, it really smacked of a, a cavalier attitude that we take again to the environment, that they were just dumping this stuff just about anywhere they could get rid of it in the, in the immediate years after the war, because we had so much radioactive waste, as we know now from certain. And we were trying to get, excuse me, trying to get rid of where we possibly could. They, they were told that they had to keep the dump to a particular place. This was a two and a half mile feet deep trench, 600 miles off the southwest of the uh, UK. So we went through and started to uh, oppose it physically. So we got through the London Dumping Convention, we got through the diplomatic routes. We produced the reports. There's a guy called Jackson Davis who wrote some very seminal reports about how uh, the radioactivity is concentrated through different benthic levels. And it wasn't a good thing to do. And the UK uh, and Belgium just ignored it when it came on dumping. And um, we, had to, we had to keep on the case. And uh, we did. And it turned into a thing called the Battle of the Atlantic. And the press were queuing up to get on the ships. Because then it was like this. And the, the TV was getting you know, dramatic footage. And it was getting closer and closer to us getting killed. And it was getting closer and closer to you know, the, 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 uh, the guys on the streets being abusive and outrageous to us. And so we went to the National Union of Seamen. And we said to a guy called Jim Slater, who I got to make a with, and uh, it was a very good friend of mine uh, before he died uh, 20 years ago in the office. He said that he would take it on board, that he would talk to the transport unions on our behalf to try to get them to put a green ban on dumping of radioactive waste uh, at sea. Cut a long story short, because we haven't got much time. Um, he won, and he convinced the, uh, I can go on indefinitely, so read the uh, I tell him definitely about the, about what happened, how we actually got um, Jim Slater to act on behalf of uh, the, the NGOs and Greenpeace in particular to stop this, because he had to go to um, the TUC conference, he had to go to individual unions. He had to argue with like Ron Tug. I remember Ron Tug. I mean, what a great thing he was. But, you know, he had to argue with people like Ron Tug. And Ron Tug would bang the table. I was there. I'd go in these meetings with Jim Slate and give him the, the background to it. I mean, um, we got so, so close to, a, to an agreement. Um, there was Aslef as well. Who remembers Aslef? The Association of Sons or anybody other footman. I can't remember what it was called down here. But these were dinosaur left wing. Um, you know, uh, union leaders at the, at the time, in the late 70s and the 80s, who didn't think they'd done a day's work and said they'd had 14 fights by 11 o'clock. So, you know, it was, it, it was a really sort of uh, full on atmosphere. But we were actually pushing them into a corner to say, why do we know we went to do this? And, you know, we gave them the whole background about why it was important to stop this because it was, in my view, it was forcing the government, the industry, and the public to recognise that we have a radioactive waste problem. And it's no good checking under the carpet of the Atlantic. You've got to deal with it. Um, because we, we expanded nuclear power and nuclear weapons all over the place. We've dumping God knows how many tonnes. And we're dumping 2,000 tonnes a year into the Atlantic. In those days, it would be 20,000 tonnes, I mean, I'm sure. So we had to stop these sort of loopholes in the way in which they dealt with radioactive waste. Uh, Jim came up trumps. He got an agreement from the um, transfer unions. They wouldn't, they wouldn't touch it. It was the first ever, I think it would be the last ever, green ban that we had in this country. And, uh, you know, we beat the plants down with the help of the unions. And they, they had a ship that they were converting. They were putting a moon port in the bottom of it. A moon port is where you bump straight through the bottom of the ship. 
uh, to avoid now the tensions of course I'm sure. And then just on the point of converting this ship and um, finishing it off, and the Union said we're not touching the radio to West anymore. And I remember going up to, um, I think it was um, Sharpness in Bristol, I did a TV program with the guys there, and they said, let's go on, on board the ship and see if anyone will talk to us. And of course, they weren't very accurate. They were just going to and going to see a the radio to West, and um, it was a job system. But nonetheless, we stopped radio to West, I think. And the irony of it all is that years later, um, in fact in 2003, I was asked to serve on the government's committee on radioactive waste management, a job which I accepted. Um, and one of the uh, options that we had to look at in terms of radioactive waste management was not being at sea. So what can you tell me on that particular one? Yeah. Um, then we looked at uh, another issue. I mean, you know, we had the unions listening to what we were saying. You know, we had we had a, a good relationship with the unions. And uh, the other thing was, if you're worried about radioactive waste dumping 600 miles off the off the coast of the UK, 2,000 tonnes a year, with a relatively small amount of radioactivity, it's not going to be worried about cellar fuel. There's 2 million gallons of contaminated waste coming out of cellar fuel every day. When we pump it into the other sea, a capital will have the impact. You can calculate what the health of the ship is from this. And we're doing this since the 40s, pumping this waste out, contamination goes up the, up the uh, west coast, it goes over to Scandinavia, you can calculate it, you can see it, you can't actually see it, but you can actually look on the charts to see where the radioactive waste is going. So we told them, it's about time you grapple with the big issue, which is cellophane. And we were on the point of, of coming up with uh, a good plan. We called it the Shutter Plan, it was, it was, it was going well, um, and then I got fired, but there's a long story. Um, but we took the, uh, on top of the, um, the ship, it wasn't the Rainbow Warrior by the end, the Rainbow Warrior is now down in the ship, but we bought another ship, the Pluto, the Sea of Lee, 4,000 pounds that cost us, um, and a bit of a bit of a bit So we got the ship, uh, and this ship went out to Sellafield, and we were going to rock the pipe. We knew the, we had the design to the pipe, we knew how far down it was, we couldn't actually figure out the sort of latitude of it, so we simply brought it early out to test it out. They started annoying you that it's a BNFM, which is really helpful. Um, when, when our guys went there to, uh, to confirm it and to get the long and everything else, they'd taken the, the boy off the end of the pipe. Um, but we looked at the phone uh, they'd sent their divers down before we got there. They altered the configuration of the pipeline. The bungs that we had ready to go into the diffuser didn't work, and we were following 50,000 pounds for being in breach of an injunction which they got uh, from the uh, High Court in London. Uh, while we were there, we were an accident in Sellafield, and um, a sort of a spring came drifting out from the pipes. It was called Purex, which is what they washed some of the uh, radioactive waste tanks out with. Really. And they had this, they did a mistake, and some of this Purex came out, contained the boat, all of us there, and then we all had to go to the Royal, the, the Radiological Protection, uh, the Royal, uh, what's it called? Radiological Protection. Uh, 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 radiological Protection. That's right. Uh, to get an uh, uh, and uh, we had uh, a high court as well. And uh, we were told that we would be fined 50,000 pounds. We refused to uh, abide with the Johnson and the Potato and tried to borrow the pipe. And uh, we raised 38,000 pounds out of 50,000 pounds from Wells and supporters and other celebrities actually. We sold stories, we shared, made it clear. And uh, we went to the court with 38,000 pounds and the judge weighed the other 12,000 pounds and they called us honourable people. And uh, that was the vote of thanks for what we were doing. And so we were doing well, you know, we were really going for this. Uh, and we did this, um, which I thought was one of the best things we ever ran. Uh, please don't take offence to this, ladies. It was meant to be provocative. We did a bit of this provocative, so we could get a lot of publicity and create a lot of argument. Uh, there were 40 million wild animals taken into the um, into the fur industry globally, 
in the year that we started, it's about 1982. And the idea was to try to stop fur farming in this country first and then go outside this country, but it was specifically designed to address fur farming in this country, mainly in particular, where thousands of people kept in dynamic uh, situations uh, for the fur industry. We, we had David Bailey taking the pictures, the models came through, everything was just running perfectly. It was a, a really, really good campaign. We were everywhere. We had a video made, I don't know if you remember it. Um, I bet you forget how old I am now, you are. There was a, a model walking down the catwalk with a, with a fur coat training and she trailed blood and she swings it around and blood spots over everybody. I mean, it was very, very controversial, very graphic. Um, in the drop. Um, within three years, we got the ban on the fur farm. There are no fur farms in this country. Um, and the fur industry took a big hit. And um, there, is, there is no revival on the, on the horizon of the fur industry in this country. I'm saying it's by the great, great guns of swear. But that, that campaign is not only a roaring success for us. But it also precipitated uh, the downfall of the UK office. Um, if it was take a step back mm -hmm. from the perspective of uh, a Canadian, David McTaggart, who was running Greenpeace International at the time, who was surrounded by a lot of North Americans. And uh, they got to the UK office and they saw, OK, they might be doing pretty well in campaign terms. They would stop the regulatory waste dumping thing, they would stop this uh, fur, fur farm business, etc. But yeah, they did that with the unions. And I mean, you know, unions to North America, it's a sort of definitely you know, Marxist and all sorts of other things. Uh, and they saw the UK office as a sort of hotbed of uh, left wing politics, which mm -hmm. But they didn't like it. Uh, and they told us we had to drop this campaign. And uh, we had to uh, make a problem apology to people like uh, International Survivor. Um, and indigenous international survivors, I think they were called, uh, who were very friendly with Greenpeace because, you know, the sort of indigenous populations automatically had an affinity with Greenpeace and the Red Indian mythology and that sort of thing. So there was this automatic um, link up between them and with them and sort of attacked an industry which they were very um, akin to. They did a lot of hunting and a lot of Inuit people depended on hunting and, and fur farming and, and fur trading in order to survive. So we were told to drop the campaign, which we refused to do. Um, because as far as we were concerned, it wasn't in our mechanism and we wanted to continue it. So to cut long story short, um, we were uh, put into a situation where we had to resign. Um, but we were told that. You're only resigning in name. You're not actually going to resign. As soon as you demonstrate to the international fraternity that you are prepared to resign, we invite you all back on the board and then we'll get on. So we all resigned. They said, Thank you very much. There's the door of fine. And so in came another lot. Um, around the time, it must have been about 1984, um, we were planning to go to the Antarctic, so I was out of the office. And just around that time, Lord Peter Melcher took home um, um, with his entourage. And um, a few months after that, the French saw the, the Rainbow Warrior in Auckland Harbour. And that made Greenpeace um, a, a world renowned organisation, and sympathy money poured into the organisation. Mm -hmm. Stories that uh, people from the Auckland office in New Zealand have not even got out the door of the office before their buckets were filled up with, uh, with money. And there was reparation from the French eventually in, in millions of dollars. Um, Fernando Pereira, uh, the, the Portuguese patrol, who was on the Ring of Warrior at the time, he was killed sadly, and uh, that again. The Portuguese authorities into being, as you know, and I'm sure as I remember, it was a massive issue for a long time. This is the first time of being uh, state sponsored terrorism in New Zealand. And at the time, 
I recall that um, Margaret Thatcher, who was the Prime Minister, was going alarming about terrorism around the world and, you know, casting out the Russians for doing this, that, and the other. She didn't say one word about the French bombing of the Roman Warrior, not one word. And uh, she didn't even mention it in Parliament. And so the Roman Warrior was sunk, but it was, a, it was a turning point for all breeders. Um, up until then, we've been struggling, we've been doing things, you know, by the seat of our pants, we had very little money, we were had to go lucky in a bunch of people who didn't really know what we were doing. So in, intuitively, we knew which way to go on and claim it. And uh, then the money came in, and uh, I'm not going to spam I'm going to say this, it's my view. Um, I think the suits and the lawyers and the accountants took over uh, Greenpeace, it expanded its campaign base massively, um, and I think it expanded too quickly, and uh, I think it started to lose its direction. But nonetheless, uh, Greenpeace became what, the, uh, what it is today. It's, it's a massive organisation which has offices in 35 countries. It has uh, money that be beyond belief. Uh, we always said in the UK, we have made a million dollars or a million pounds, whatever it might be, and we had 200,000 supporters. You know, we could really change the world. Well, they've got, you know, 10 times that now. And uh, I don't think they're changing the world. No, you know, they're not going to be So I think it was a very important event. I mean, the French thanked the Rainbow Warrior because it was off to the road to protest about French weapons testing. They thought that I think the vessel they would put paid to, uh, to that sort of activity, but in fact, of course, as we know, it made me get stronger and stronger, and they ruined the day they did it on shore. Because eventually, you know, a few years later, you can work with Stephanie and Bannon together. But uh, I was um, I was sort of out of at the time, and uh, I still knew Taggart quite well. I was still on the international board of directors of Greenpeace, but I just didn't have an office to go into it every day. And uh, when Taggart said to me, uh, one day, um, got a campaign coming up, and we want to talk to them. And we want to get into the Antarctic. And uh, so that's interesting. And uh, so do you like to lead the expedition? And I didn't think it's a good joke. I was in the alternative for um, someone who was born, bred on Scots and Amundsen and everything else. It was a dream. And I said, sure, I'll go. I couldn't keep it was dream. We got a ship together. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea was to go to the Antarctic, to set up our own base camp right next door to the Americans, who were the biggest operators in the Antarctic, of course, and who were the biggest pollutants in the Antarctic, and to demonstrate to them and to demonstrate to the world at large that the Antarctic belongs to everybody. It doesn't belong to the Americans or the Brits or the Argentinians or the French or the other uh, claimants like Argentina. It belongs to everybody. And it's the only place in the world where you can go ashore with a passport and you can go where you like and you can put your tent up where you like. We put our tent up in the middle of there and we give the American base. And we just put it right in the middle of the road. And uh, we said, you know, sorry if it's inconvenient, but we've got a right to do it. And, you know, this is not yours, it's everybody's. And we had a hard -like relationship with the Americans for a long time. They wouldn't even give us the weather um, because of safety reasons. And uh, we eventually, they accepted us as being legitimate, uh, if private, into the business, but they, they felt was a liability in the Antarctic. Uh, the first year, we went down in this old tub, we used to feel a black pier, actually, in the middle of the land of Greenpeace. And uh, it wasn't my strength. I mean, I've got many things, very difficult situations. Um, we were on the point of back on the ship at that time. And, about a week before this picture was taken, there was an ice strengthening ship called uh, the Southern Quest that was run by a group of hooligans, uh, <laughs> they were. It was incredible. Um, who did the footsteps of Scott expedition. They went down to the, to, to the Antarctic and they tried to do these foot, to, to retrace Scott's footsteps. And their boat was crashed between two 10,000 tons of ice. And they had to get rescued by the Americans, which was not good for private expeditions. But nonetheless, um, they, had a, they had a raft. We, we, we eventually met them on uh, Ross Island, and they had a raft which they had in the ship, which they, which they uh, let go. It's a good one down And it was called the Spirit of Incompetence, which I think. <laughs>
an exhibition for the with you and went through a storm with even the old salts on the ship. So it was uh, a bit frightening. And we had three days, 77 knot winds. It was about 100 mile an hour winds. And uh, it was just absolutely steak, absolute steak. And we had to I mean, you were lying on your, on your bar, and uh, you literally, as the ship went down into the trough, you literally came off the bar. You know, you've got negative gravity. It was amazing. And then when you when the ship on the on the on the swell, um, you know you get across the ship, and so you constantly be in the swell. Um, and I was like, "I'm just tall enough." But then we had a guy on uh, called somebody you might know him. I know Pete does. Paul Brown from the Guardian. He was the environment correspondent, and he didn't sail very well. Um, but during the storm, um, we had a, a huge uh, dust made on the bridge called Albert. And uh, Albert said to Paul, Can you get me a bit of sponge from the kitchen, please, Paul? And, you know, when you're feeling sick at sea, the last thing you want to do is take your eyes off the horizon and go down in the bowels of the ship and cut somebody a piece of cake. But Paul went down, cut this piece of cake, put it on a plate. And as he was walking out the companionway with this piece of cake, he was washing the cake. And as he went down through the trough, the cake was becoming off the plate. <laughs> That's, I mean, this is an extraordinary experience, an extraordinary and then we say, it was quite a thing. And then you get to the ice and it uh, flattens out. And it's absolutely stunning. Um, well, I couldn't like, really swim in the entire time. When I got back, people said to me, what's it like? And I just said, oh, it's wonderful. I can't stop it. It's great. And these pictures don't do, do it justice either. Trying to paint the mountains, uh, trying to talk to the mountains. Some of these pics were. Still, in fact, when we were down there one year, and there for about five years, five seasons. But um, one of these uh, pigs is called Mount Minto, and uh, when we were down there one year, there was a bunch of five uh, Australians who, there was the Australian bicentennial year, and they were climbing Mount Minto, which had never before been climbed. And um, when we got to it wasn't a rescue. I wanted to make. I wanted everyone to make. It wasn't a rescue. It was a hastening of that getting them down the uh, off the glacier. And um, I just read the diaries, which are all in the book. You know, just a bunch of things. The sort of time that we spent trying to get them down off the mountain, getting the weather that was good on their side, halfway up the mountain, with the weather that was good our side, and then it's still done. Anyway, we got them down, but the. The only thing is that they had then to get in a tiny little yacht. There were six of them. There were three crew on the yacht. They rigged up um, platforms on this yacht that, that they literally had to crawl into to sleep. And they got to sail back after having sailed down this thing, sailed back to Australia across the Southern Ocean in this tiny little yacht. And we left them um, at, the, at the sort of brag end of the season, late February, when the weather's getting worse and the ice is coming in. And um, they radioed us two days later. They'd already been knocked down, bound, knocked down. Their rigging had gone, all sorts of things. But they were saying, oh, we, we're fine. We've got Jim, we can sort it out. We're making five knots, we're doing fine. And they said, all the way back to Australia. It's true. Good. And, um, you know, the two these things, the cold, uh, isolated birds. I mean, it was just, just a stunning place to me. And that's a typical. Uh, it's hard to see it's going yeah. as peaceful and as tranquil as you can imagine. It's absolutely stunning and beautiful. And then you can do this. This is, this is the moment. This is the American base. Mm. And um, they, they, they just bulldoze this waste out into the, uh, onto the other one. And this is, this is a place called Winter Quarters Bay, which is called Winter Quarters Bay by uh, Scott. Um, and with the space now by which we're dead, because we, they, they just, there's tens of thousands of tons of rubbish at the bottom of Winter Quarters Bay. It's full of heavy metals and it's contaminated to hell. And we talked to scientists about remediation, when they said, forget it. We're going to make it worse. Just, just let it go ahead, make sure you, they stop at some point. And we did actually make them stop this, this um, time, as they call it. 
Nothing went into it. Um, all there was from the Antarctic all that was a lot of damage that would have been done. This is completely waste from mile after mile after mile along the, along the coastline. It's a very dispiriting sight not to be seen in the Antarctic. It's full of people, that's what they do. That's, uh, that's their base here at the back, and you just cover the stuff out until the, uh, until the ocean wait for, for the summer thaw. And don't do it anymore, unfortunately. And then we've got our old friends at the front. Um, this is just up the road from, um, from the American place. I do want to do a few of them. And here, the French were constructing a hard rock airstrip across five islands. The, the interesting thing, why the French are here in the first place, is to study 75,000 breeding pairs of penguins which occupy these five islands. But now they have decided that the hard rock airstrip is more important than the penguins, so they're grasping these islands to pieces. Um, the interesting thing about this is that so we can do anything we could to try and stop them. Um, we, we blockade their, their, um, their heavy vehicle spin um, up on the airstrip and they can beat the hell out of this vehicle, their, uh, their vehicles out. Um, that's, I think that's such a wrap second. But we did everything we possibly could um, to stop them, and we denied them a lot. We went to the north end of the island where they were taking rocks, went to the gap between the two islands. But that, in actual fact, was their downfall. Because what happened is that as the gap between the two islands got narrower and narrower, the current got stronger and stronger, and they could not put down large enough rocks to keep the bridge between the next island together. And, and nature literally decided that you're not going to build this airstrip yet. Wasn't it? Do we agree, please? The current took the rocks away. They couldn't actually bridge the gap. And they decided that they didn't it. So it was written by the fall. Not, not much to do with us. This is the Russian base. We um, uh, can't see it very well, but this is the bar on the top. It's still down to the, uh, into the sea ice. And uh, we decided that we'd fly in there uh, one day. We had two helicopters that we could use. And um, the idea was to inspect their base to see if they were abiding with the agreed measures. And then they started to inspect their base. And inspections are quite common. Uh, other other countries go to other bases. The French do it. And they actually do it on other countries' bases. So they were quite pleased to see us. And we flew in. It was a very long way. And uh, we had to lose the back beacon to the floor before we could pick up the front beacon for the in the Russian base, which is a bit weird. How do you got there? Yeah. As we flew in, I don't know if you can see any other teams, there were thousands of knots all over the sea ice, and we were the way of seals. But when we took them to the sea ice, they were, they were empty 55 gallon drums of oil. So as soon as they used them in their generators, check on the stick. And so now, yeah, you know, as the sea ice moves out, it just takes the valley with it. It's just extraordinary uh, way in which to treat the valley. But that to one side and the inspection to one side, we had, we had a good time and they were, I mean, it was quite extraordinary to see. They still had the circuit boards with matches holding bits of wire in, sort of spiking around, short circuit and everything else. And, uh, but they were really pleased to see, they were even more pleased to see, we had two women with us because they had been there for two years and they hadn't seen a woman for two years. So they were treated very well and we got given champagne and vodka and all sorts of things. And next day, we had some from the other. But uh, the inspection of the base revealed that they treat the, uh, the environment there in a very cavalier way. So, I think that's the end of the Antarctic stuff. What I'm doing now, I've got lots of things in my plate at the moment. One of the things I'm working on is to try to put a ship together to go out to the North Atlantic giant, where there are tens of thousands of tons of uh, rubbish, the seaborne rubbish, most of it plastic. Which is slowly degenerating, um, and is causing all sorts of problems for uh, marine mammals and marine life generally. Um, they did a survey on one of the Hawaiian islands where there's a lot of albatross, and um, out of the all the remaining albatross on the island that they looked at, I think it's something like eighty percent of the adults and the chicks have these decayed uh, bits of plastic called nerves. In their crops, they just they just assume it's food and they, they feed it to their chicks. Um, there's one in the Atlantic, there's one in the Pacific, there's one on the Indian Ocean, 
uh, all the big oceans of the world have these um, these giants, as they call them, which collect where the, the currents eddy around. And we're doing nothing about it, basically. And what we want to do is to weed this, the proposals out to from the town of Stephen Mill and looking at it. But we want to do a, 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 a testing voyage just to go out to the giant and to see if it's possible to, uh, to allow some of this stuff uh, in a way that allows us to bail it, to, um, to reduce it to, to something that you can actually cut back to land, either for recycling or for destruction or whatever, in order to show that if it's possible, then bigger organisations should come in and help us over it. It's going to take a long, long time, but it might be possible for us to remediate this through um, you know, physically interfering and physically getting out and clearing this sort of stuff up. I'm also involved in an organisation called Nuclear Information Service at the moment, and they are campaigning against Trident, which I know is close to the heart of the nuclear drug in Scotland. Um, I mean, I've only been there for a while, uh, and in its own, what I've, what I've learned is, is kind of terrifying. The Trident submarines, I tell you here, we've got four of them, one of them is on patrol all the time, it's called Constant at Sea Disposal. Um, with uh, each of these submarines closed to eight nuclear missiles, uh, but each nuclear missile is equipped with 40 nuclear warheads, and each one of those warheads is eight times more powerful than the bomb that destroyed your machine. I looked in the mass, so I did it, uh, and it turns out that uh, each submarine has the killing power for an awful lot, an awful lot of people. And I personally don't think that's the way we should live. And I think it's um, absolutely outrageous that we've got a, a government and not only that, a, a super in opposition that's not saying anything about any of this. The only people that are speaking up about it are the SCP. I really want to get, to, uh, get, us, get, get some mischief going in, in Parliament over the next few years. In 2016, the decision about whether to renew Trident takes place and uh, the current plan is that they will do a life for life replacement at the cost of a hundred billion pounds over the next thirty years over the lifetime of their of the of the, of the fleet. And that can't be right. And uh, the thing that's extraordinary I think is that you know in, in all of these situations you find a minority of nations acting as the tail that wakes the dog of the majority of nations. There are 109, there's 190 nations in the world. 109 of them have signed up to say, we want a nuclear weapons ban. End story. And I went to Foreign Commonwealth Office briefings and, you know, young, um, well, very young actually, about 12 to me, you know, representatives of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office come out and give you mealy mouth statements from their political supporters about why we should keep it and why it gives us status in the world and why we should keep trying because, you know, the, the world is uncertain. The reason it's uncertain is because we've got these. That's what, it, that's what it's all about. And, and if, if we were to do anything at all, um, as a bunch of people here tonight, go and make sure your MPs vote against this and make sure that your MPs, your SNP MPs, convince everybody else to do the same. We've got to tightly fit this in the early months of 2016. And the time after that is 2019, when they make a decision about developing an entirely new warhead, a more destructive, more powerful warhead in collaboration with the United States, who else? And that's another uh, target for us to look at in 2019. Um, just the cost of replacing the time over 30 years. We could scratch the issue for for 30 years, make them happen if we did. We've seen them pick up the other. I've been paying for a thousand university teachers every year for 30 years, that sort of money. The group of Britain's annual investment in renewable energy for that sort of money. It's like 20,000 new jobs in house construction. It's a huge amount of money that we're putting into weapons that are not only illegal, we'll never be able to use them, or if we did, we'd, you know, well, it, it's, it's axiomatic, is it not, that no sane person press a button to destroy 100,000 people or even, you know, three, four, five times that. So, they're in this book, they're illegal and they're inhumane. That's it. Thanks for so much.
I'm I'm sorry, but I'm really sorry, but I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. Nur es geht gut, du Claire, ist es zu neun gekommen? Wir haben zu neun. Du hast Yes, thanks. Oh, good. Nice to hear it. He's the exception. Somebody else want to make a quick comment or ask a quick question? Yeah. Uh, what do you think, as an individual, I can do in my own life, uh, apart from doing what you've said and lobbying my MP? But uh, in my own life, like stop drinking coffee, hot drinks. What? What's? Yeah. Um, well, the people used to get in touch with us and say, same thing. Same thing. What can I do? I want to start to, you know, bring this group or one of the rich ones in. I mean, I, I think you just got to get out there and whatever floats your boat, get out and do it, and get a group of like-minded people around you, and go and campaign. Think about the campaign. Strategize the campaign, think about where the pressure points are, but as an individual, we're talking about you can give up sort of thing. Is that right? To, to make a difference? Uh, either way, what's, what's most effective? Well, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people who would tell you that um, becoming vegetarian and convincing the rest of the country to become vegetarian would have to be the best thing to do because of the you know, energy issues and, and the, uh, the, the way in which we are using. The, uh, the fisheries and the oceans and the farming in order to put food in the mouths of cattle for us to eat rather than actually directly eating it. That's a, that's a big concern, obviously. But, you know, I mean, I think overall you've just got to look at your lifestyle and think where you can contribute uh, given your circumstances and go out there and work with the people who are doing it. You know, there are endless organisations out there that are doing some very good work. Water Aid is one I've got a lot of time for. Um, you know, I think that the, the NGOs that are, that are established, such as Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth, have got to start making connections and links with the aid development organisations and indeed those who are involved in peace and, and disarmament. They've all got to come together because with their two sides of the same coin, we've got to start making a much bigger difference by linking up and demonstrating that, you know, we are, we are not the environment groups over here and the aid developments. We're all working together. Because, um, you know, there are endless examples of where looking at an issue in a different way, looking at it from uh, sort of left field, would give you a much better hand on how to deal with it. It's not all about going out there, you know, running around in boats and, and climbing on oil, oil tipping, excuse me, oil uh, platforms. It's, it's about strategizing a campaign, working even collaboratively if necessary, working in positive ways with people who are going to be listening to you more and more as the, as the problems get bigger and bigger. Now, the, the nuclear industry in this country is it's about to collapse. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of it. In its wake, what's going to happen? Now, we've got to be thinking about plan B because things that we are, we assume are going to be, you know, just a matter of pushing at the door and it all happens are not going to, not going to come to fruition. Now, we've got to deal with climate change. We've got to deal with energy. We've got to deal with Farming in particular, I mean, I, I just can't believe what we're doing to the land every day of the week. We've got to deal with these issues and we've got to make sure that ordinary people understand the issues. And you've got to get out there and make sure that people understand and, you, and hear what you have to say about it. I think inform that's yourself and inform everybody else. People do not understand um, what the issues are because they, they live in such a, a nucleus within themselves instead of looking at the big picture. Yeah. And I think that's one of the main problems. 
you know, the, the question, the comment here is that people don't understand the issues and they need to sort of close the line. I agree with you, absolutely. But, you know, we are, we are dealing with a media that is not particularly interested in a lot of this stuff unless it's got celebrities attached to it or unless people are dying. You know, they are, they are sort of sensationalist side of the media that we're dealing with. We've got to make sure that from, you know, I've got a series of articles published in a regional newspaper up in Suffolk. Do that. Write articles, you know, talk to people. Write letters to the newspaper. Get, get the message out there and engage people in this conversation. Go to your parish council meetings and ask them about what's happening locally. You know, get involved in stuff and make sure that we start from the bottom and, and work out, hopefully, you know, some of the politicians that have got the brain will be working from the top down as well. But you're right, it's a big problem. It is a big problem. It is. Well, I'd love to actually <laughs> say, oh, look, keep the library open until later, because there's obviously a huge amount, you know, in terms of issues and in terms of future, in terms of campaigns and, you know, what people can do individually within organisations. Um, but just like to say, you know, obviously you came up to speak about your autobiography, but it's obviously much more than just your standard autobiography. It's about kind of history and, and political history of the environmental campaigning kind of movement. And it's also about, from your, from your personal perspective and narrative, so it's a fantastic read. So I'd highly recommend you reading Pete's book. Uh, Claire's at the back uh, from Fledging Press. And she's going to be selling copies and Pete's going to be hopefully sign, sign, staying with us. Got a site There's a lot more in the book than I've been talking about. Exactly. Yeah. There's lots to, you know, to read. Uh, you know, in terms of adventure, drama, you name it. Uh, also have copies in the library and obviously, yeah, quite welcome. So thank you very much. Thank you. Once again. Thanks. Thanks. Jenny, I just think, 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 Jenny, I just think,